Hi, hello, it's Ro. I'm a clinical psychologist from Sydney, Australia. For the longest time as a student, I knew I wanted to be a psychologist, and all I knew was that psychologists help people, do therapy, they work in mental health, but I didn't actually know what a psychologist did until I reached my master's, which is literally five years into my university study. Today, I'm going to tell you the ins and outs of what actually happens and what are the different stages. What do we actually get trained in? Because I think we don't actually get told until we're literally five years in. If you're new here, hi, my name's Ro. I post weekly videos on Thursday. So if you're interested in psychology, therapy, what it's like to be a psychologist, or just like the field in general, then subscribe and join me for these weekly videos. Alrighty, so firstly there are many different types of psychologists. When you think about psychologists you're probably thinking about a clinical or a general psychologist and primarily our role involves delivering some sort of psychological treatment to someone with a mental health disorder. However, while this is the one that most people think about when they think about psychology or therapy, there are other specializations. There are actually nine areas of practice endorsement, including organizational psychology, where you go into organizations and you help them streamline. For instance, you get sent to an accounting company and your job is to make their team of 40 people more efficient. Your job is to figure out who are the key players and who actually help the team and who's not so effective. So you help with firing and hiring. You might help with remuneration and how much to pay each person to motivate them. So there's organizational psychology. There's other specialities such as sport and exercise psychology. They work with elite athletes, they work with how to get the most out of them. They might also work with athletes at the end of their sporting career and how to deal with that grief or that period of transition, moving away from this kind of endeavor, super high intensity, maybe very famous and in the public eye, to not doing that sport anymore. So that's like sport and exercise. Then we've got like educational and developmental psychologists that help all in like IQ testing, testing for ADHD, learning difficulties, really figuring out what's going on in someone's brain and actually diagnosing a learning disorder or mental health disability, something like that. Um, then you've got forensic psychologists. They go into jails and correctional facilities. They are helping people who have had contact with some sort of forensic activity, criminal activity. Um, maybe they're doing more rehab type stuff. Maybe they're doing workshops on mental health and stress and emotion regulation. So there are many, many types of psychologists. I think by far the most common, and this is reflected in the training pathways as well, because for instance, forensic psychology is offered in like two unis, whereas clinical is offered in like five or six unis just in like New South Wales. So I think the most common is general psychologist or clinical psychologist. And if you're interested in the study pathways and like how to get into them stuff, the last video I did about pathways is gonna outline all of the study requirements. So the APS is the Australian Psych Society and they have an official definition for what a psychologist does. And today I'm gonna talk about their like therapeutic clinical psychologist. And it says, Psychologists study individuals and groups to better understand how people, communities, and societies function and devise ways to empower them and help them thrive through understanding mental and biological functions that drive behavior, which is a very um, <clears throat> broad kind of title. And so I'm going to go into literally the areas that we study during masters and literally like what I do day to day. First bit is assessment. And assessment basically means we're trying to figure out what it is about a person, a complete stranger that we don't know anything about, what it is that they're coming to us with. What is the core issue here? So assessment might involve questionnaires. So like a mood questionnaire, trying to figure out what their level of their mood is, like low mood, high mood. Um, and then we know based on their outcome on the questionnaire, what they compare to the rest of the population on. So we might do questionnaires. We might do them on things like anxiety levels, types of anxiety. We could do it on the way they see the world, belief questionnaires. And so you guys have all probably done some sort of questionnaire or personality questionnaire before. As psychologists, we're trained to figure out what questionnaires or you know one or multiple that we need to use in order to figure out what is going on with this person. So the second way we kind of assess is through neuropsych testing, which is literally running tests to figure out where people are and their brain function. So we do tests like figuring out their processing speed or their working memory function or their like ability to learn English or maths. And there are tests that we get trained in to figure that out as well. And so that's another little factor in our assessment. There's also obviously the therapeutic assessment where you actually meet the person one-on-one. -on -one. Usually it's an hour or an hour and a half. And you learn actually the way that you ask 
questions and what are good questions to ask to figure out what's going on. So for instance, a lot of people know maybe when to reach out for a psychologist. They know, you know, when you feel really down, maybe when you're crying a lot, maybe when you feel like you have really low mood, they would go to a psychologist, but often they don't actually know why or what's going on or what causes that. So it's our job to actually figure out from people just saying things like, you know, there's poor sleep, I'm not eating as well, I'm getting stomach aches, I'm getting tunnel vision, you know, occasionally when I'm really stressed out, I actually can't remember. We're trying to figure out and piece together their symptoms and try and ask the right questions to get the full picture because that's gonna help us with the next step, which is diagnosis. Assessment is basically like, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to gather information from the person so that it helps us with stage two, which is diagnosis. I'm gonna tell you why there is such an issue with self-diagnosis. As mental health professionals, we spend a lot of our master's training learning all of the different diagnoses and they all fit into this massive textbook called the DSM-5 and this is the version number five, but there have been four other versions and they keep updating it based on the newest psychological disorders or how our current society says is a mental health disorder. So this changes with culture, changes with society. It used to be that homosexuality was actually classed as a mental health disorder and now that's been updated. So our current view of mental health is that we have this textbook and there's a list of diagnoses and we learn the symptoms for all of them. Yeah, or at least we try and do most of them or the most common ones. The issue with self-diagnosis is often people have a list of symptoms and they go to a specific diagnosis like depression, you know, and they tick off all of them and they're like, oh, I meet all the criteria and therefore I have depression. They don't have the mental health training to have understood all of the other things that could be causing this same diagnosis. And so that's the issue of just using like confirmation as diagnosis. We need to know what else could have a similar profile of symptoms because mental health is such, like it's so many crossovers and so many diagnoses have actually really, really similar symptoms. We wanna know exactly what symptom profile fits each mental health diagnosis. So a really big part of our training is also about differential diagnosis. What separates bipolar from depression? What separates bipolar from schizoaffective disorder? What separates schizoaffective disorder from schizophrenia? Because all of them will have some identical types of symptoms. And when I say diagnosis, I don't mean that we necessarily have to give everyone a DSM-5 mental health disorder when they come to psychology. Oftentimes I actually don't even tell the client the diagnosis if it's not helpful. Yeah, so diagnoses are helpful as a, a way of maybe joining a community if that's helpful. Um, maybe it's a, a good way to tell other people what's going on for you. For some people, it's good having a diagnosis so they feel like, hey, I actually have a label and a, a way to understand this as opposed to just feeling like I'm doing the wrong thing. It's just with me, I'm just bad. So diagnosis can be helpful, but another part of our job is figuring out if the diagnosis is helpful and whether that diagnosis needs to actually be relayed and understood or whether we just kind of go ahead and treat it and Talk about it like something else. For instance, borderline personality disorder is characterized by a lot of emotion dysregulation. Emotions, you know, due to early childhood trauma, uh, the, our relationship to our emotions are just confusing, they're not always accurate, and our emotion regulation skills can be all over the place. But telling people they have borderline personality disorder sometimes isn't helpful because there's so much stigma around it. And so oftentimes I'll just say you have complex emotion dysregulation or complex trauma. Yeah, and sometimes that's a, a more helpful base, explaining it by what actually happens rather than a label that's misused a lot, like for instance, bipolar. Yeah, so firstly, we have to figure out the assessment, ask all the questions, do all the questionnaires, and then we come to a diagnosis or a label. Usually this is happening within the first and second session. So we're trained and we're practiced to kind of make this process pretty quick. Next stage is something called formulation. And I kid you not, I don't think I understood what formulation was until my sixth year. But essentially how I understand it now is a formulation is how you understand the diagnosis and this person's history and how it all kind of cycles together. So for instance, understanding that someone has social anxiety 
okay, that, that's good. Like we have a treatment guide for social anxiety. However, the way that you treat social anxiety for someone who is constantly public speaking and gets bullied at school and has had feedback over and over again that they're not a good public speaker is gonna be different to someone who actually does public speaking often, gets really great feedback, you know, has no real genuine reason to be anxious about it because they're in a very supportive environment two separate people with the exact same diagnosis can have very very different treatment plans and approaches and formulation tries to piece together someone's early experience to we'll talk about things like okay well based on your family history or based on your early experiences it makes a lot of sense that you would have developed these types of beliefs about yourself and then you know those beliefs about yourself make a lot of sense that they're front of mind right now because this person at school is really similar to that person early. So we try and piece together history with current events. I hope that kind of makes sense. But the idea is that we make a really, really individualized plan for every person because no two people are the same. No two diagnoses are the same. There's always a different history and a pathway to that. And so we need to really, really understand the root of problems and what were the unique individualized personal social cultural psychosocial physical factors that led to this the better your formulation the better your treatment's going to be so i spend quite a bit of time just sitting by myself after the sessions like trying to figure out what is it about this person that led them to this particular point so formulation is something that clinicians are all kind of doing in their brains but i also really enjoy having session two as a formulation session where i literally draw out exactly what I'm thinking and I show it to the client and I say, does this kind of make sense to you? Does this cycle actually represent what you're stuck in right now? So that's formulation, that's step number three. Then step four is treatment. And this is the bit that I actually knew about before I went into psychology, but there are multiple forms of therapy and you choose the form of therapy based on what the client's presenting with. So really, really common ones are cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, or ACT, dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT, really good for complex trauma or emotion dysregulation. There's schema therapy, which is a bit more focused on early experiences. Um, there's EMDR, like the rapid eye movement desensitization, desensitization, interpersonal therapy, family therapy, parent-child interaction therapy, so many different types of therapies. And we get trained, depending on your university, on maybe one or two. So our uni did a bit of, well, mostly CBT and a little bit of schema. And as you go on in your psychological career, you pick up new types of training. And every year, I think on average, most people are kind of trying and kind of like wrapping their heads around a couple each year. So for instance, when I first started out, it was CBT and DBT. And then the year after I really focused in on ACT. And then the last two years I've really focused in on schema and schema mode and kind of like advanced schema training. So you'll find the type of therapy based on the types of clients you work with and also based on your interests. Some people will really enjoy working in CBT, super practical. You can take something out of the session and use it literally today. You can um, really see huge changes in people's anxiety or low mood. Some people really don't vibe with CBT because it involves quite a bit of like practical work, you're writing, there's a lot of monitoring, and they really enjoy something like schema therapy, which is a lot about experiencing difficult emotions, going back into old memories, doing processing of trauma. And they really like working in that early history. How can we change the way that we talk to ourselves? How do we change our relation to certain emotions or memories? So you'll start to develop that as you try it. I really, I think there's so many type A people who watch this channel and I'm sure you're like, okay, I have to Google and figure out what I like. Just go with your training and then when you're like out of the program, experiment, like read a little bit of this, do a bit of this training, see what really gels with you. And you'll also notice that certain therapies will work with certain population groups. So it depends like who you work with, what type of therapy you specialize in. And then the last bit is kind of the process skills. And what that means is not just what you do, but how you do it. So for instance, learning about how we develop rapport with people, learning about how to sit with silence in a session, learning how to deal with group dynamics, like, you know, 
we're trained mostly about one-on-one, -on -one, but what if you have 10 people and you're here for an emotion regulation group and they're all getting triggered by each other? How do you handle that? We're talking about things like timing of a session. How do we keep to time? How do we make sure that we give valuable homework and feedback? How do we get feedback from supervision? How do we actually set ourselves up so that when we meet with a supervisor, instead of just getting there and being like, oh, you know, it was a tough week. How do we structure our questions and know what to ask? So these are all process skills and it sounds, I can understand just my mental loop of what I've just said. It sounds like so, so much work and it's like, how could I ever get there? I just wanna say like, take it slowly, take it one day at a time. I know it's a lot and I'm, how many years out now? I'm. I'm like four or five years out in terms of actual work experience and only now are like some of the things really clicking into place and now I can also see how much more training I can do and how much more I can improve and that's part of being a psychologist that you're constantly reflecting and improving on your practice but yeah I hope that was helpful and it gave you a bit of an overview on everything that we do. In terms of treating or clinical psychologists, those are the main things you're focusing on. Then there's like a bunch of extra side stuff like accounting and like how to schedule and time management and stuff. But those are a lot of trial and error. You're not really getting taught any of that during your training. So yeah, I hope that was helpful. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to post them down below and I'll try and answer as many as I can. And do let me know if there's any other topics that you're interested in because I do post weekly videos and it's hard to know exactly what people are interested in or what they kind of know already and they don't need more info on so yeah have a chat to me thanks for watching bye